sorry for just uh, turning it on now. So I, I will very briefly summarize again what I what I said. Um, the whole purpose of uh, doing numerical simulations or CFD for that matter is to reach a result which is converged. Convergence means that my numerical solution, so what I get out from my algorithm, from my computer code, is as, clo <coughs> is as close as possible to the exact solution of the partial differential equation. The partial differential equation, um, that one came from our mathematical and physical modeling that we have also discussed in the beginning, um, you know, doing some approximations when it comes to compressibility or um, uh, neglecting friction, for instance, whatever we thought was, a, was appropriate. But once we have a partial differential equation, we just want to get the best possible solution to that partial differential equation. In an ideal world, we could do that analytically. And there are cases, of course, when I can find analytical solutions, like, for instance, for the abaction equation. Um, but unfortunately, that's uh, not always possible, in particular when things become nonlinear, as the Navier Stokes equations are nonlinear, then I need to use numerical schemes. So I have, I have a, 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 numerical a numerical solution, which I would like to be convergent towards uh, this, this exact solution. OK, what is the problem here? Well, the problem is um, I cannot really show that my solution is convergent without knowing the exact solution. As soon as I know the exact solution, then of course I can, you know, I take I can take the norm of the difference and I can plot that as a function of delta x, for instance, or or um, delta t, and and I can get an error and I can get a, a, a convergen, convergence order as well saying how quickly it converges when my grid is, uh, is refined. But for doing that, I need the exact solution. And there is no point in doing simulations when I know the exact solution uh, in, in, a, in a general case. So therefore, um, we need to find another way of being able to show this um, show convergence. And therefore, we have introduced two other concepts. One was the concept of um, consistency and the other one, the concept of stability. And actually they have uh, kind of uh, two slightly different purposes behind it, but combining them together will actually give us something that looks like a convergence. If we start with uh, consistency, there the idea has been that uh, we need to make sure that the truncation error um, goes down with, let's say, delta x and, and, and delta t. So the idea of consistency is to show that the, the truncation error is getting smaller and smaller as I grid refine. The truncation error on its own, that is the error that I make when I go from the differential equation, so from the PDE to my um, discretized equation. So when I go from the PDE, uh, from the differential equation to the difference um, equation. So we can say that the truncation error, that's the difference between the difference equation, I mean, if you now think of finite differences, um, and the uh, partial differential um, equation. The important thing here to, to realize why I can actually show consistency without knowing the solution is I'm not asking whether the solution converges. I'm asking whether the actual equation converges. So the, the residual of the, uh, of the equations, whether that or the difference, whether that goes to, uh, goes to zero. The typical way of calculating or computing a truncation error is by using Taylor expansions um, so that I, can, that I can see that all the error terms that I have, that they are multiplied with at least one delta t or one delta x, which is then getting, getting smaller and smaller. The, the concept of an order is also um, tightly connected to the consistency. The order of a numerical scheme is typically um, the order of the truncation error. So for instance, if you, if you think of a first order 
scheme for you know, calculating finite different or a, a, a derivative, that means that the truncation error has a, a leading error term, which is of order delta x. So that is consistency, that the difference equation is related to the partial or goes to the partial differential equation. Stability, on the other hand, um, there, the, there the idea is that the, um, the numerical solution that I obtain that that numerical solution um, is going towards the exact solution of the difference or the discretized equation. So that means here the idea is that I calculate numerically a good solution to the discretized equation, not to the partial differential equation, to the discretized equation. And um, that means, as we have discussed, that we need to make sure that errors that can come from, uh, from various sources, um, you know, round off errors uh, and so on, um, that these errors do not amplify. Therefore, the basic idea with stability has been to look at the amplification factor, either in physical space or in, in spectral space, and making sure that that one is not, um, is not growing exponentially for, uh, for too long time. Now, the idea is, I, I guess you get the point. The idea is if you can show consistency, consistency and stability together, so consistency is saying that, aha, uh -huh, we have discretized the right equation and stability means we can solve the discretized equation well, that these two things together actually imply uh, convergence. And that is um, exactly uh, the idea of the, the Lex Lux Richtmeier equivalence um, theorem, oops, uh, which states that for a um, well-posed, consistent, and stable um, finite difference scheme, um, that convergence is actually uh, necessary and sufficient. So therefore, we have a proof which works for linear cases uh, that consistency and stability together give convergence if the problem is well-posed. Therefore, also the, the idea of well-posedness, which we have introduced at the very beginning, is, um, is actually a, um, a crucial concept also, um, also in, in this proof. Does this answer your question? Any more general questions that we could uh, discuss? Do you want to hear my um, additional material instead? Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. If you have any more questions, I mean, uh, if you remember something, just uh, just ask it also during the break, and then you can go back. Okay. Additional topics. So I would like to start with looking at a little bit in more detail on the. Uh, on the time integration again and, and, and the stability. You, you, you realize that I, I kind of am a little bit obsessed with stability, or not just me, but within CFD, we were always obsessed with stability. And of course, that, that is exactly because we need to be able to show stability. Without stability, we're not convergent. And actually, this is a big problem um, because in principle, there is no proof for, I mean, and now I'm talking just about numerical side, not, not even the mathematical or the, of, of the uh, continuous problem of Navier-Stokes that there is no existence and uniqueness proof. But now I'm just talking about the, uh, the numerical discretization. There's no proof that the various discretizations that we do are actually um, uh, stable and um, well, consistent, yes, but, the, but they are stable. So that means in the end, there is no proof that our numerical simulations are, are converged. Of course, we know they are from, uh, from experience. But still, one thing is clear. If 
our numerical integration is not stable, so if it kind of blows up, then we certainly have not a good result. So from an engineering point of view, we want to make sure that our, our schemes that we use are stable or as stable as, as, as possible. Therefore, this obsession with looking at, um, at stability. So therefore, um, let's go back to analysis of uh, time integration. And once more, and I would actually like to start with um, uh, an interesting equation. So consider now the advection diffusion equation. Um, I start in 1D, uh, but we will go to 2D afterwards. So how does this look like? Um, du dt, that's the time derivative. Then I have the advective part, a times du dx. And that's the same as nu times d squared u dx uh, squared. That's, that's an advection diffusion equation. Of course, this, uh, this one here would be the advection part, and this one here would be the diffusion part. Now, let's let's um, discretize this whole thing, um, and um, let's just uh, do the simplest possible way. I mean, we have um, we have a grid. Oops, maybe I should make make it a bit um, equidistant. So we have a, we have a grid like this. This is my my x coordinate. And I'm just using central finite, di central, uh, finite difference. So if I want to calculate the point in uh, the, the, the function, this point, I use central finite differences, both for the advective term, so for the first derivative, and for the uh, diffusive term for the second derivative. So I do the scheme that we termed forward time central space for all terms. Okay, now what happens uh, to stability? First, consider the stability for the terms, for all terms independently. Well, I mean, maybe not the terms, but the, the, the type of the equation independently. So that we have the stability for the advection, and we have the stability for the diffusion. Okay, what about the advection? What, how, what, what is determining the stability for the advection, or how would we calculate the stability for the advection? Does anybody know? How would one do that now? Well, um, actually, I, I guess I can understand why you're not saying much because it's actually a slight problem because if I do, so the typical way, I guess, for a, a convection or advection dominated problem is that I'm using a CFL condition. We know from uh, when we talked about that, that the CFL condition is good if you, if you look at true hyperbolic problems because it, it really looks at how the characteristics kind of move through the domain. So we look at the CFL condition, keeping in mind that this is only a necessary condition, not a, um, a sufficient uh, condition. And from that, we know that, or we know if we apply that for a, a, an advection uh, equation, we know that sigma, which is the speed times delta t divided by delta x must be lower equal one. This is for a central finite difference. Of course, we also know that if we, if we were, do, were to do a uh, correct analysis, we know that it's actually unstable. Central finite differences for advection are unconditionally unstable. But we can still write down the CFL condition in that way. The diffusion part, um, also there we can do a von Neumann analysis um, and um, the results that we got uh, was that 
uh, another factor, beta, which was uh, nu times um, delta t divided by delta x squared was lower equal than one half. Now I'm not hundred percent sure. Have we have we together derived this one, the the, the one with the, with beta? I think we did we did right. Or should I should we quickly derive it also? I think we did that already in in one D. Do you remember whether we did that? Or asking differently, should we do it? Should we derive it quickly together? It's okay. just, yeah, okay. Okay, let me, um, let me just uh, derive this as, a, as, a, as an insert, okay? It's, it's very quick. So derivation, Derivation for uh, stability a viscous term. So, uh, so the in, in one D, so that the problem that we look at look at is du dt is nu times d squared u dx squared. And now uh, the idea is to discretize with forward time central space, as as we uh, as we said. Um, yeah, for sigma we certainly did it for. For, for beta, maybe not. So um, if we do forward time central space, so that means the time derivative is then uh, simply uj n plus one minus uj n divided by delta t. That's the forward time part. And then the central space looks like this, um, nu divided by delta x squared. And then we have the, the, the central finite differences for the second derivative, which is uj plus one n minus two uj n plus uj minus one n. So that is that is the discretization. And now, if I want to know the stability, I do a uh, von Neumann stability analysis. So von Neumann analysis, and there the idea is, aha, uh -huh, I do Fourier. I say that my u u j n will be one Fourier mode, so that directly implies that this is only valid for linear problems uh, with constant coefficients. Otherwise, I could not just look at one um, Fourier mode. Um, so we have u j n that is then u hat k at time level n times e to the i um, k alpha x j. To, to um, kind of make it clear, this one would then be um, my, my time dependence. So I have the level n and level n plus one and so on. And this one, the Fourier mode, so the e to the i k alpha x j would be my uh, spatial uh, part. So effectively what I'm doing is a separation of variables, separation into, into, into time and into space. Now, maybe up here in the, in the exponent, it's maybe also interesting to mention that k would then be the wave number. And in the way that I formulated here is that this is an integer wave number. So that means it's zero, one, two, three, so an integer number. And alpha would be the fundamental wave number. So that's, that's typically used if I have domains that do not have a size of two pi. So that essentially this fundamental wave number would be two pi. So alpha is two pi divided by the length of the domain. And you see, if I choose the domain length to be two pi, then of course two pi divided by two pi becomes one. And then the fundamental wave number is not necessary to be written down. Okay. <clears throat> So I, I would like to do now my fundamental wave number. So that means I just insert this, uh, this Fourier ansatz into my discretized equation. And if I skip a few steps here, I then get um, uk, u hat k n plus one being the same as u, u hat k n 
um, plus <coughs> nu times delta t divided by delta x squared. Um, and then I have a, a brackets where I can directly write e to the i k alpha delta x plus e to the minus i k alpha delta x minus two u hat k n. I guess you, you recognize where that stuff comes from. The minus two obviously comes from this, and this comes from this, and this comes from, from this one. Okay. Well, with this, um, we can then um, use uh, our favorite uh, Euler formulas to simplify what is written here in the brackets or in the bracket. Um, so we can see that a sum of two exponentials will be two times cosine of phi k minus two. And this phi k, I can define as essentially just being the exponent here, um, k alpha delta x. So that means with this, I can then specify my spectral amplification factor, g hat k. Um, well, the, the absolute value of this one needs to be lower or equal one for stability. And that means the g, g hat k is essentially just what I have here in the brackets, uh, or one plus what I have in the brackets. So that means simply that one minus one lower equal one plus two nu delta t divided by delta x squared times this uh, cosine of phi k minus one. And this needs to be lower or equal one for stability. So that means this last equation here already is kind of the one that, that I need to use to determine um, my stability bounds. If I now look at this a little bit in more detail, I see that I have a cosine phi k minus one. Well, a cosine of something minus one, a cosine can go from one to minus one. So that means one, a cosine minus one um, is something that goes from minus two to zero, what is written um, in here. Um, that means that also when I look at everything here, so I have one plus something that goes from minus two to zero. Well, um, that means uh, that if this is largest, then it would be zero and one plus zero is lower equal one. So that actually means that directly put it like this, that this condition is always fulfilled. Irrespective of how my phi k is uh, chosen. So this is always um, so what what we what is remaining to to or what remains to look at is actually this this other condition minus one lower equal uh, this one here if I just go in and simplify a little bit there is a minus one here and then I can I can make it a bit easier um, this will um, end up with two lower equal two times nu delta t divided by delta x squared times one minus uh, cosine of this phi k. If I simplify, simplify that again, noting that um, the cosine again goes from minus one to one. So the maximum value here is reached for cosine being minus one. Then I get this result. One half is lower equal nu times delta t divided by delta x squared. As I said, this was reached for cosine of phi k being minus one. And I realize now that, that this number here, this nu times delta t divided by delta x squared, that's actually a non-dimensional number. Um, and this one is what I typically call beta because it seems to be kind of the, 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 the relevant time scale for a viscous problem. And of course you directly also see why this is a time scale for a viscous problem because it's exactly delta t divided by delta x squared and that is the kind of the viscous um, the viscous time scale. Yeah, so so that means then that the stability requirement 
for um, for uh, the diffusion equation is exactly what we have written here, beta lower equal than one half. So that's now that that was the derivation for um, for that. One note I can make: if I had done the same thing with an implicit Euler scheme, so that means instead of um, of forward time, I would have a backward time. Where did I have it here? Um, if I if I essentially had n plus ones here on the on the right hand side for everything, then it would turn out that um, the implicit Euler would be unconditionally stable. So that means um, if I want to get rid of um, the time step limitation for the viscous term, then I, I could use an, an implicit Euler. Now the, the important or one important result that I, I see from here is, um, and I think this I mentioned uh, earlier, I just want to highlight that once more. One very important result is that here I have a delta x squared, whereas here it's a delta x to the power of one. So that means that for the, the diffusion term, refinement in x is much more severe for the time step because the, the delta x goes in quadratically. So that means if I refine my mesh in x by a factor of two, my time step actually goes down by a factor of four rather than just a factor of two as for the convective term. So that means there's a natural limit on how much I can refine for having still reasonable time steps. Of course, also there, there's a, there's a physical meaning um, uh, behind that. And, and that of course is that the viscous contribution is much, or that leads to smaller time scales, and and therefore this is um, uh, this ends up in this um, in this way. But this is something to, to keep in mind, in particular with the combination or with the observation that the implicit Euler is actually unconditionally stable, which means that sometimes it's actually better to do a um, implicit treatment of the viscous term because that's really the one that would kill your time step or make your time step very very small. Okay, but then, then now we have shown that if we just consider uh, the two terms independently, so the two types, advection, diffusion independently, we have either a CFL condition or we have this, this beta condition. Now, what I would like to do after the break is um, to discuss briefly, yeah, what is, what is actually the correct, um, what is the time step limitation for the combination of um, the viscous or diffusion and of, or diff, let's, uh, of advection and diffusion? And this is actually a, um, a study question problem. I forgot which uh, which question it is, um, but it's it's quite an interesting uh, problem uh, that you could uh, try to solve um, as preparation for the exam. But this we will um, look at after the um, after the break. So we have um, maybe a ten minutes break, fifteen minutes break. So we will continue at the quarter past. Okay. So thank you for now, and we continue after the break. So welcome back after the, the break. Um, so let's continue now with the, um, uh, let's continue, or maybe maybe we can start with the poll that I did uh, just before the break, namely what programming languages you would like to look at or to use. And it turns out that actually it's surprising or maybe, I don't know, but um, it's, uh, 96, so let's say 100% actually want to do MATLAB and 50% want to do uh, Python. And uh, no, 
And then a little bit of uh, one fourth wants to do C++, but nobody wants to do Fortran, nobody wants to do Julia. Interesting. I would perhaps not have expected it in this way. Okay, very, very interesting. Okay, um, but then uh, we can continue with uh, uh, what we did uh, just before the break. Uh, sorry. Namely, um, we have looked at we have looked at the stability of the diffusion equation and the, the advection equation, and we are seeing that there is two different stability uh, requirements or conditions for the for the advection of the diffusion case. One where we have delta x and the other one where we have delta x squared. But um, but now uh, I guess the the question would be, what happens um, when we combine the two uh, parts of the equation and actually do a stability analysis of the of the really of the real uh, coupled problem? As I said, this is actually something that's a study question, but I can directly give the result here, and uh, the result is. It's sigma squared lower equal two beta lower equal one. This here is the is the result of if you do a combined advection and diffusion equation. Now you see it's actually two different conditions here. One of them, this one here, I mean that's of course easy to understand. That's the same equation that we have uh, just found here. So this one, that's uh, condition number one. And that is simply um, the one that we had before, beta lower equal one half. And this translates, if you now write it as a, as a time step limitation, this um, translates to be a delta t lower equal one half delta x squared divided by, by mu, by a viscosity. The second condition, that's actually slightly different. That's now sigma squared must be lower or equal than two beta. Um, so sigma squared divided by beta must be lower or equal than two. And also this, I can rewrite that I get an expression for delta t and it will look like this, namely that two nu times uh, divided by a squared. That's the condition for delta x, therefore delta, for delta t. Now, there's a few quite interesting uh, things to realize. So first of all, uh, in this one, this equation is actually independent, independent of x or of delta x. That, that's kind of an interesting, an interesting result because it, it means that stability doesn't mean on, or it does not depend on any refinement in X. It's really just about, um, well, in this case, the, um, the, the velocity and the viscosity. That's very different to the condition that we had for, uh, for um, the CFL, I mean, that we have for the CFL condition where we really looked at the size of the, of, of the element, so delta x, and then we had the speed and delta t and the characteristics and so on. But here there is no delta x anymore. So it's the delta t is entirely determined by the viscosity and the speed, the speed in uh, squared. So that's, a, that's one observation. Another observation is that the viscosity is actually either in the numerator or in the denominator. So that means, so for instance, if you look at the, at the case where we have low viscosity, uh, high viscosity, I'm sorry, low Reynolds number, high viscosity, high viscosity that would correspond to low um, Reynolds number. Well, which of these two equations is then relevant? Well, it's actually the upper one because they're, um, I divide by, by a large number. So that means for, for the low, for low Reynolds number flows, it's just the first equation that is relevant. The other one where the viscosity is in the numerator, 
that actually doesn't matter if this one is um, if this one is high then you know this 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 limitation is high as well it doesn't it doesn't actually matter so for high viscosity we run into something that is called the um, the viscous time step limit That's exactly the uh, the equation or equation number number one, and that is a typical thing. As soon as you have a, an explicit code, you have low Reynolds number, high viscosity, then you go into this um, this viscous time step thing. For high Reynolds numbers, on the other hand, um, for high Reynolds or low viscosity, that is. Then we're in, 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 in equation, then typically equation number two is the dominant one. And then you see in some way that you have a convective time step this A squared, which is stabilized by the presence of, um, of viscosity. We can say here, the idea is that you have convection, convection stabilized, by viscosity. Why do I say that? Why do I say it's stabilized by viscosity? Well, remember the case, um, remember when the viscosity actually goes to zero, and that of course would then be the, the case of the advection equation. So for, for nu going to zero, um, we are actually unstable again, because then we solve with a central scheme, the convection or the advection equation, and that of course is unstable as we know. But now we see it directly also from this equation. If nu goes to zero, well, then the, the numerator goes to zero, meaning that the time step limitation actually becomes zero. And of course, that's not, uh, that's not good. But at the same time, you also see that the, the lower the viscosity becomes, the lower the time step. And that's exactly um, because you have less and less viscosity, which is there to stabilize the unstable convection. So therefore it, it kind of goes, goes up. So this is the, uh, the correct uh, stability limit. There is kind of a funny, a funny story behind it. If, um, if um, some of you are interested, I can uh, just copy in um, the title here or, or the, the front page. If you are interested in knowing a little bit more about the stability or the, the, the calculation on how to do a stability analysis of this, um, of this coupled problem, you can look at this paper uh, from 2003. Um, they call it the controversial stability analysis. Um, the reason for that is that uh, up to a book that was uh, published by or published in 1984, um, it actually turned out that this stability analysis was performed in the wrong way. It was the, the, the inequalities were not considered correctly. So up to 1984, there were textbooks where the stability result was actually uh, quoted from. It goes back to a wrong stability analysis by Fromm, who was a famous uh, person in this, in this area, who did the first analysis in 1964, which was um, as I said, not, not correct. But even now, um, if you go, if you search on the web, sometimes you see it's still wrong in, in some lecture notes or, or some, some other books. But look at the paper and look at the stability, at, at the study questions to, to see how one would actually do it uh, correctly. It's not, it's not very difficult. Okay, but now uh, that we have um, prepared the stage, now I would like to go on and actually do um, the analysis of all that stuff in two dimensions, because that is what is relevant for our code and you know most of the most of uh, of other applications, of course. So we have now two different things which we need to, or actually three different things that we need to translate into into two D. One is the CFL condition. The other one is the stability analysis for the diffusion, and then the stability analysis of the combined problem, also that in, in, in 2D. I guess we start with the perhaps easiest bit. Let's say A 
that would be the CFL condition in tooling. Because that's, that's really what you're going to use also in the code and um, you know, in, in, in most simulation codes that's, uh, that's actually done. Now, if we think back, what was the CFL condition? I mean, what did it really say? Well, it said that the domain of dependence um, of the PDE should be fully contained um, in the uh, domain of dependence of the numerical scheme. And if you, if, you, if, you, if you think back, the basic idea was for the numerical scheme to actually have a chance to, to get the correct result. It needs to have information of the whole domain of dependence of the actual solution. If the solution is, is determined by, by quantities that are actually lying outside of what the numerical scheme can see, of course, the, the numerics have absolutely no chance of finding the correct solution. Yeah. Okay. So um, how can we how can we do that? <clears throat> well, let's look at the at an at, at an advection equation in two D. Advection equation in two D looks um, um, maybe something like this that we have. UDT, but then we have um, um, a vectorial velocity. Um, so A, and that should then be multiplied with um, nabla of U um, being zero. And if I write that out, so DUDT plus AX times DUDX plus AY DUDY, Is zero. So this is a this is a 2D advection equation. It looks like a 1D one, just that you have an advection in, in, in a vectorial advection velocity. If I now try to 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 draw that in, in 2D, so I have um, x and I have y, because I have a mesh now that is that is in in two directions, maybe something like this. And um, I have a, a vectorial advection speed, so AX and AY, maybe something like that. We can project that. This would be AX, and this, this here would be AY, um, something like that. Or actually, maybe I should, because this is space, so maybe this should be delta T times AX, so that's the space, and this is delta T times a y. So this is how far a, a particle that is located in the center point would actually move with, with one time step. The, the coordinates, of course, are if this is i comma j, this would be i, i plus one j, uh, i minus one j, this one would be i j plus one, and so on. OK, if I now define a central scheme. Well, what do I take? I take, oh yeah. I take this point, I take this point, I take this point, I take this point. These points are used to, to, uh, to do my optic. So that means the, the uh, domain of dependence of the, the difference equation is actually this. This is the domain of dependence of the Find a difference scheme. Just in the, and that's the domain of dependence of the of the finite difference scheme. Now, what is the domain of dependence of the of the exact solution? Well, that's actually this uh, this green arrow that I have already plotted. Because if I want to get um, if I want to get the solution um, here, 
I know that it travels exactly this length. So that means this line here is the domain of dependence of the um, of the of the analytical solution. And now the so if I sorry this is quick. And now my my um, uh, CFL criterion simply means well the the green arrow needs to be within the uh, purple square. So that means I have here the scaling factor, the delta t, of course, which I can just scale in such a way that this arrow is inside the, the square. And if you now think of, of how to do that, um, trying to think of how we, I could define this line in, 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 in kind of um, in, in with mathematical expressions, you will actually find that the, the, the actual condition will be that delta t plus or times ax, now I'm taking the absolute value because it's a, it's a metric, this divided by delta x plus delta t times delta t times a y divided by delta y must be lower or equal one. Essentially what it means is that this line here, this linear line is encoded in, 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 in these two uh, terms. Okay, this is the CFL condition in 2D. And obviously you can, you can think of it uh, directly in, in, in 3D as well, because this guy, I can say this is the same as Sigma, just in X, you know, because you have the speed in X and Delta X in X. And this guy would be Sigma in Y, and this should be lower equal one. So you can say that in, in 2D, this here is the CFL condition, CFL in, and of course, for higher dimensions, we just continue with that. Um, you can you can simply say that delta t times the sum of the speed in direction i divided by delta um, in the direction i should be. One. So that's the straightforward extension of the CFL condition to two dimensions and three dimensions. You just add the, the various CFL or the, the, the various current numbers uh, to each other. Okay. So this was uh, part A, the CFL condition in, in 2D. Well, now we also need to do the other thing, namely the, the diffusion term in 2D. This term will be particularly interesting because that's exactly a term that, or that's a condition that you can check in your code, because if you run it with low Reynolds numbers or high viscosity, you will actually just do a, a diffusion equation, not more than that. So the, 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 the corresponding equation here would be du dt the same as mu times d squared u dx squared plus d squared u dy squared. And I would like to do the stability of that. Now, it's actually, I don't need to, I don't think I need to do all the steps here. Uh, maybe just write down the, the important ones. First, I write down my fully discretized system just to tell you how, how this is being done in 2D. So my forward time would be u i j n plus one minus u i j at n divided by delta t. And that is then the same as mu times, well, now it becomes a little bit uh, a lot of writing, but it would be the two derivatives in the, in the x and the y direction. So we have u i minus one j n minus, minus two u i j n plus u j i, uh, i plus one comma j n divided by delta x squared. So this is the first derivative. Then we have the other derivative, which is then divided by delta y squared. And we have 
u i j minus one n minus two u i j n plus u i j plus one n. And now I'm just doing exactly the same as I have done in, in 1D. I'm also uh, putting in or defining a Fourier coefficient. Um, but now the, the issue is that this is actually in 2D. So I need to approximate my UIJN with a 2D Fourier uh, decomposition. So that means U hat KL. So I have two wave numbers, one wave number in X, the K. So this is um, wave number in X. This would be the wave number in Y. Um, so I've, I've, I have um, uh, uh, two wave numbers, of course, still the time N. And because I have two wave numbers, I also have two Fourier ansatz functions. And that's in the same way as before, I have i k alpha x i times e to the i, and now it becomes l. And um, now I'm using beta here. Don't mess it up with the previous beta. This is this is now the fundamental wave number times y j. So alpha and beta, these are the fundamental wave numbers. Alpha and beta. With this, I can also define my phi k um, that I had before, which was k alpha delta x, and I had a phi l, which was um, l beta delta y. And now, if I do everything a little bit um, uh, more rapid, I, I try to. Uh, um, and do all the steps uh, at once, I get as a result for my uh, spectral amplification factor, which is then uh, u hat kl n plus one divided by u, u hat kl at n. So, um, Let me check my computer is a little bit slow. Let me try to make it a bit faster. Not sure I'm succeeding. So maybe some with too many windows open. No. Okay. Um, yeah, so if I continue here, uh, I can di then directly say that my um, spectral amplification factor will then be one plus two nu times delta t divided by delta x squared times cosine of phi k minus one. That's for the, for the first term. And then the second term will be something like two times nu times delta t divided by delta y squared cosine of phi l minus one. This is my spectral amplification factor. And um, as before, uh, the basic idea is one needs to show that the absolute value of this guy is below one. We do like this. Let me, let me turn off the virtual background. I think that's what, what eats up all the computer time. So, maybe. Okay, that's, I think it's better. Good. Um, so, I have um, uh, this term and this term, which we know from before, that's beta x. And beta y, so it's the same as the beta before, but but now I have it in, in x and in, in y direction separately, and the, the whole rest of of how to um, how to uh, treat now this um, the cosines and and so on, finding the maximum values, that is exactly the same. And I guess 
you can all see uh, where this ends up with uh, the condition will just be that in the end it is one half of the stability criterion will be one half is larger equal beta x plus beta y. So because we have kind of one term and another one, so it's a sum here. And before, if you remember, uh, when we did the uh, when we did it, then it was just it was just one term. Okay, and of course now also here for multiple dimensions. I mean, you can you can you can understand that this is just a. Uh, you, you just add more of these betas um, if, if there are any higher dimensions. Now, I would like to just show you one very kind of interesting thing, which may or may not be obvious. For me, it wasn't. Just assume the case where we have an equidistant mesh in all directions. So delta x is the same as delta y. Then it means that beta x is actually the same as beta y. And it's the same as eta. In that case, well, the stability criterion then becomes beta, which is nu times delta t divided by delta x squared. Well, it's actually not lower or equal than one half as we had before. Is lower or equal um, uh, to one fourth, and the reason for that is, well, we're actually, you know, this is this is now a two uh, beta. I mean, it's, it's it's the same beta, but it's it's two of them. So that means um, the dimension goes in as a factor to this one half, or the inverse uh, dimension. So for um, a three D case, it would not be. Um, one fourth, but it would be um, one sixth, for instance. So compare compare to the one D case where we had beta was lower equal than one half. At least to me, this was. Um, is, I mean, to, to to me, this is not fully obvious. Kind of, I, I would not expect this to to come up come up. But I really recommend you to test exactly this condition in your uh, project code. Because again, if you run the code with um, a high viscosity, low Reynolds number, you would exactly get this condition because then it's the, 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 the advection is completely irrelevant. Everything is determined by, by the diffusion by this term, the viscous limit as we, as we call it. Okay. So now we have uh, the condition for, well, maybe maybe I should not make this one yellow because that's maybe not the, the, the relevant. This one is the one that is uh, perhaps the, the relevant one. So this is the condition of 2D diffusion. And we had the condition up here for 2D CFL. And of course, now the question is, okay, now we have done it for um, diffusion and advection. Yeah, what is, what is now the condition in 2D for the combined problem, for combined advection diffusion? Well, we know CFL says that sigma x plus sigma y needs to be lower equal one. We know that the diffusion gives you beta x plus beta y must be lower or equal than, than one half. If I again just translate that to a velocity condition for, uh, for the CFL, um, what I will get is something like delta t is lower equal than one divided by ax divided by delta x plus 
ay divided by delta y. Or if I do it for equidistant, uh, it would be delta x divided by ax plus ay. So this is for equidistant. How do you write that? Equidistant. So. Well, for, for the time step for the diffusion, um, I can also write what, what delta t will become. This is then lower equal one half times um, one divided by nu times one over delta x squared plus one over delta y squared. And if again, I'm doing that um, equidistantly, I'll get something like one, four, one divided by four um, of delta x squared divided by nu. So these are the two conditions for this for the separate uh, problem. Now, the, the, the question now is, what is this for the combination? Also here, I don't want to do it um, here. I would just show you the, the result, which you can then uh, try also in the code. We know that the viscous limit will be the same. So this is certainly one condition. That's, as I said, the viscous limit, which you should uh, uh, try out um, in, in your code. And then the other condition, uh, the second one um, that stabilizes the, the, the convection via, um, via uh, the viscosity. The second one is then sigma x squared divided by uh, beta x plus sigma y squared divided by the y. And this should be lower or equal than two. And again, this is a condition which is independent of delta x, which still is surprising to me. Very good. Now, what does this now, or what are the implications, or what should you maybe um, test in the code or observe? So test these these um, conditions in, in, uh, in the MATLAB code, because the Navier Stokes equations that you solve, they are, well, it's not ex exactly advection diffusion. It is advection diffusion with, um, with a pressure term. And of course, the discretization is also not fully central because you have various velocity components and you have a staggered mesh uh, and all of that. But there is something that, a few things that you can really see. The first one, as I mentioned it a few times now, the viscous limit, that is really something that you can observe. And this is a, um, this is a hard limit for, uh, for stability in the case when you have low Reynolds number or high, um, high viscosity. And the reason why you really see that is because this was derived exactly via the, um, via the von Neumann analysis. And as you know, the von Neumann analysis, at least within the, the limitations it has, it is necessary and sufficient. So the viscous limit, this is certainly something um, you should try. So it's, it's this guy. It's actually also a good test whether you have implemented everything correctly, because you can, you can then check whether the scaling of the viscosity and all of that is, is done in the proper way. When you then run your code for higher Reynolds numbers, lower viscosities, then you will see that maybe things are not so easy anymore because, um, so for higher Reynolds numbers, well, the CFL condition, the CFL condition is only um, necessary. And in addition, you have a nonlinear problem. Your convection speed is the is not constant. It's 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 um, it's the solution, uh, the velocity the, the velocity solution. So that means you actually need to do a linearization necessary uh, linearization linearization um, is um, is necessary. And as we 
this cost in the course? Well, the typical way would be to say, oh, AX is perhaps the absolute value of U, the maximum velocity over the domain, and maybe the vertical velocity in the same way. It would be the V velocity maximized over the domain. Because you have an equidistant mesh, so you can you can take out delta x and delta y anyway. So try that out. And uh, as we discussed, because we don't take the the, the nonlinearity into account, you need to add a, a safety factor. So meaning that um, your delta t in the simulation is then maybe some, let's say s times delta t uh, nominal, the one that comes from, or delta t CFL, maybe you can write it like that. Whereas this s perhaps is, I don't know, 0. 1.5 or a factor of two or something like that. So that you're really sure that, that you're away from this uh, instability. You can then also try this combined limit. Um, the one that we, that we just derived, derived. And you will actually see that, that it turns out that this is way too strict. So you can be stable even if you go below the time step um, that is given by this combined limit. And of course, now I guess you start to realize also the difficulty of uh, actually performing CFD calculations, because in the end, choosing the time step is, is, is not actually very clear what, how you should do it, how you should define it, and, and then in the end, how to, how to calculate this as, as you go along. In particular, now we use the very simple numerical method for the time integration. So it was an Euler forward. But imagine now we would, maybe take a wrong Ikuta scheme, and we would do a split into an explicit and an implicit part, so treating the viscosity implicitly, the, 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 the advection maybe explicitly. Imagine if we also had some uh, flux splitting in the sense that um, we would have some, we would take the characteristics into account for doing upwinding in, in a certain direction, maybe not even upwinding to 100%, but we would do a blended form where we have a little bit of central differences and a little bit of upwinding uh, just to stabilize it. So you see there's, there's a lot of different aspects that then in addition come in just for determining you know, stable time integration. And all of that is not, is not always fully supported by, uh, by the theory, as, in, as you will see when you, when you try out a little. Okay, um, I think this is all I wanted to say about the, the time integration and, and how to derive also these, these limits in, in 2D. Now that I see that it's nearly uh, five o'clock, I don't think we need to talk more about um, characteristics and impose, imposing of boundary conditions. Um, I would just like to ask you once more whether there is any question, something that we should discuss a little bit more. Now today, if not, then we would meet again tomorrow at 10. And from 10 to 11, I will present the, the, um, the project, the result of the project, show you some videos and, and discuss what you actually see. And then from 11 to 12, it would be, um, I guess, uh, Fermin taking over for uh, doing the, the homework session for homework number six. So therefore, my question to you, uh, is there anything more that I maybe should explain um, once more or something that, that was unclear that I could take up? Okay, I guess that seems not to be the case. Then uh, I think for once we can finish five minutes early 
Um, I wish you uh, a nice evening. And as I said, we meet again tomorrow at 10 for, uh, for, the, last, uh, for the last lecture before the, before the actual exam. Okay, thank you very much and uh, see you tomorrow.